Good morning. How is everybody? All right. We are here for the second National Day of Healing. I am so delighted to see so many of you in the house despite the snow. I'm a Washingtonian, so you know when it snows, usually we cancel everything or at least postpone it for a couple of hours. So I, I admire and support and endorse the sort of Chicago grit. It may be snowing, but we will go out there anyway. Anyway, I want to thank you again for joining us for the second National Day. How many of you, show of hands, were here for or, or attended the first National Day of Healing? Well, we got a couple of people, so thank you for coming back. For those of you who weren't with us, we have a great day in store for you. Um, I'm excited. Um, this event really is sold out. We have over 150 people who have uh, registered to be here. So we expect a few more to trickle in. When you see them come down the steps, if you have room at your table, just sort of wave and welcome them into the fold. Um, this uh, event, for those of you who did not attend last year, is actually catalyzed by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And it's the day that they have envisioned for people, organizations, and cities around the country to call for racial healing. Now, in the wake of what we've been through in the last week, it seems that we were very prescient in thinking about the need for racial healing. It's the idea that we are going to bring people together in their common humanity and take collective action. And I want to underscore that, collective action to create a more just and equitable world. My name is Amina Dickerson. I am a board member, a proud board member of the Woods Fund of Chicago. And I'm going to be your MC for the day. I'm so pumped about being an MC. I can put that behind my name now. Amina Dickerson, MC, OK? <laughs> I'm also the immediate past board chair for the Woods Fund, and I'm so proud of the great work of this foundation. Woods is a very bold grant-making foundation that finds and funds projects that draw on the power of communities to fight the brutality of poverty and structural racism. Uh, we are, that is the Woods Fund, is admi the administering organization for the regional truth, racial healing, and transformation initiative. So you'll hear us refer very often to TRHT, and that's what it stands for, Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. And uh, we established the first National Day, as I said, last year. And uh, we served as a co-host for, co for that. And we're inspired and uh, really proud and honored to be a part of this citywide effort. We have an all-star group of uh, co-hosts the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, uh, the Field Foundation of Illinois with their great leader, uh, Angelique Power, the Chicago Community Trust. We work very closely with Terry Mazzani, looking forward to working very closely with Helene Gale, Metropolitan Family Services, and you'll hear from their uh, president in just a little bit, Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, Adler University, the Chicago Reporter, Pierce Family Foundation, Little Black Pearl, and of course, our major funder, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. TRHT, Greater Chicago, is one of 14 regional initiatives funded by the Kellogg Foundation around the country. And TRHT, uh, Greater Chicago, has partnered with the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center to celebrate this day um, with uh, the theme of, what is our story? That is what we are focusing on today, a goal of bringing us together to identify the common threads that bind us, to build our story, a story that unifies instead of divides. The power of storytelling is that it allows us to create belonging, to create empathy, to create understanding, to understand what we have in common with someone else. So it will catalyze, we hope, some relationships today as we tell our stories, as we hear other stories, and it will motivate us to fight for justice. TRHT has partnered with the museum for this event because they are committed to the same mission that actually underscores what TRHT is all about, to unearth and jettison the deeply held belief in the hierarchy of human value and create a more just and equitable world. 
We have an exciting day planned. We're already behind schedule, so that's the way we begin. So we, we will be uh, pushing to catch up. You'll see students walking by all day long, so they are here to learn about the same issues of racial healing and justice. And um, this afternoon, they, there will be some facilitated tours of the Take a Stand Center, a new, really innovative, groundbreaking um, exhibition here. And uh, we wanted to, I think we've done this already, take a minute to greet the people beside you because you're going to be hanging out with them all day. OK, check that box. Um, but we do hope that over the course of the day, you'll share your stories. Uh, and exchange ideas and find yourself in alignment with the stories of others. That is an essential part of our racial healing, finding what is our common ground. Dr. King called the foot soldiers of the civil rights movement drum majors for justice. And I hope as you participate in the TRHT events today and in the future, you will find your voice, You'll feel empowered by our stories and be moved to become active in the ongoing effort to face truth, to heal our communal wounds, and to help to transform who we are as a nation, as a city, and as community. During lunch, we will provide more details about how you can get involved with TRHT Greater Chicago. And um, with that, I'm going to just start with a couple of logistics. We don't have breaks built into uh, this morning session, so feel free whenever you need to to step outside. The bathrooms are right there at the back of the hall, left and right, men and women. I'm going to ask you to please silence your phones. Nothing like having your phone ring, especially if you're like me and it's always in the bottom of the purse in a pocket that I can't find and it rings and rings and rings. So put it on silent now. But we want you to keep it out and active because we want you uh, to tweet and to post. The hashtag is down here at the bottom. And uh, let people know how you're feeling about joining with so many others and exploring what is difficult sometimes territory for us, uh, but in the, in the search for stories that, that um, unite us. And so now what I'd like to do is introduce the CEO of the museum, Susan Abrams. Susan has more than 25 years of nonprofit museum, business building, and financial management experience. We just recall that we were together, or worked together when she was at the Children's Museum. But under Susan's leadership, the museum is leading globally in Holocaust and museum education, and recently opened this groundbreaking three gallery exhibition that you're going to get to experience today, Take a Stand. We are grateful that she's opened the museum doors to us. And so please, put your hands together and help me welcome Susan Abrams, director of the museum. Good morning. Another thank you to everyone for braving the Chicago snow and coming out to join us for this very exciting and important day. I'm energized already just looking out at the audience, contemplating our agenda and knowing that we have the day together to have these conversations that will help to move us all forward. Thank you to the Woods Fund for inviting us to be part of this. Thank you to W.K. Kellogg Foundation for this important idea. And again, to all of you, who uh, many of whom we have already partnered with, and we look forward to engaging with all of you, those especially who we have not previously had the opportunity to work with as we move forward together in this work to heal our world. How many of you have visited Chicago Children's Museum previously? Okay, so it's, it, what did I say? Oh, we were just talking about Children's Museum. How many of you, let's try that again. How many of you have visited Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center previously? Fantastic, okay. Uh, good on both of those things. I'm a past staff member and board member at Chicago Children's Museum. So um, we're, we are gratified to have the opportunity to share with you. For those who have not been here before, uh, when, when Grace approached us about being part of this day, we jumped at the opportunity because, as Amina pointed out, our work aligns so very well, so closely. We use the history and lessons of the Holocaust to inspire our visitors to speak out, to recognize the dangers of hatred, prejudice, and indifference, and the power of their voices and choices to affect change. Change for the trajectory of an individual's life, 
but also change for the trajectory of a community. We have always done this work through our exhibitions and our weekly programs. We have uh, four permanent and three changing exhibition spaces and uh, we use those changing exhibition spaces to either go deeper into an aspect of the Holocaust or very often broader into other areas of human rights and social justice. And as Amina mentioned, we are so proud to have opened the end of October the Take a Stand Center because that really uh, for us is a statement of how important this work is of moving from the history and lessons of the Holocaust and making those important connections to our world today. As you'll see, we do this starting with uh, an interactive holographic experience where you'll hear survivor stories. We do our work uh, very much through stories of individuals who make up our rich community. So you'll hear those stories and again see how an individual can change those trajectories that what the difference of a person or people speaking up for others can make. Um, and then you move to the upstander gallery. And in the upstander gallery, we feature three upstanders from the Holocaust, but we also feature 40 others who are working in the areas of civil, social, environmental, and economic rights. So doing that work that so many of you in this room are doing every single day. So our visitors are now inspired, and it's in, regardless of their areas of passion, to want to make that difference. And in the third gallery, the Take a Stand Lab, we give visitors the toolkit themselves so that they can begin to take action right here at the museum. And as you'll see, they also can email to themselves those tools for advocating, spreading the word, giving of themselves financially or in so many other ways, founding or joining an organization. So they can email and have those tools at home, at school, or in the workplace. At the, uh, towards the end of the day, you'll have that opportunity to experience the Take a Stand Center, and if you have additional time, we invite you as well to the second floor to see BESA, a code of honor, an exhibition about Muslim Albanians, who uh, I don't know how many of you know, it's uh, not particularly well known that Albania was the only country in the world that had more Jews at the end of the Holocaust and World War II than in the beginning because of this code of helping one's neighbor. So that is an, an exhibition on the second floor that is uh, a special exhibition, so won't be here for too much longer. Our youth exhibition is called Make a Difference. And it really is the, uh, say, eight to 12 or 13 year old uh, version of the Take a Stand Center, showing, again, the importance of the choices we can all make on a daily basis to stand up for ourselves and to stand up for others. Um, of course, our Karkomi Holocaust exhibition is the bulk of the first floor of the museum. Uh, and shortly, we will be opening just next door in our special exhibition space on this level, an exhibition called Speak Truth to Power, uh, created by Kerry Kennedy and the RFK Human Rights Center, which, as its name implies, is all about defenders of our human rights doing their work globally. And the exhibition profiles those folks uh, who can inspire all of us. So with that, I would close by telling you we developed the tagline for our museum, take history to heart and take a stand for humanity. And I close by saying how proud we are to be here with all of you today, working together to take a stand for humanity. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm now going to invite Grace Ho, uh, president of the Woods Fund and Rick Estrada, uh, our new chair of the board and president and CEO of Metropolitan Family Services. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here working with Amina and Rick. Um, and as I look at Juan as well, I think back to maybe 20, 25 years ago when I first met Juan and Rick when we were doing uh, immigrant and refugee rights work. And it's amazing to see how we've been sitting in different seats across time, but also um, always committed to this vision around improving the community around us. So I'm so glad that you are all here. Um, we're like, will they come? Well, they won't come. And we're so excited that it's sold out. And that we're actually able to let everybody in I, um, who was on the waiting list because of the wicked flu bug that's going around. 
Um, but we're so excited that there's interest from you to be a part of a day that is about racial healing, storytelling, facts, and transformation. For me, TRHT is about creating a space of belonging, a space that is open to people across sectors, background, theology, politics, race, age, unified around a vision where the hierarchy of race has been dismantled, where race doesn't predict outcome, where you live, where you go to school, your income, your wealth, and your health. What has resonated with me in folding this work into mine over the past year is to realize that this process will not be linear, it's not clear, and it's not gonna be easy. It will take head and heart work to transform, understanding our history, accepting our truths, challenging false narratives, and connecting to our own biases, our own trauma, our own stories to build relationships with others so that we may then all belong to each other. How can we change the way that we think, know, see, and hear, and how we feel about one another, especially those who we think are others? How can we be heard and hear others? That's what today is about. And how can we then use this power to fuel transformation? This day was identified purposely to commemorate the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King so often talked about visions of a beloved community, a community in which people are of different backgrounds recognize that we are all interconnected and that our individual well-being is linked to the well-being of others. It is in this spirit that we are drawn to this work, this hopeful process that is driven by truth, belonging, stories as a way to make change. So we welcome you to think about your story as you hear others today and think about how you can contribute and participate in this work because everybody is welcome. This learning journey is to harness current work, talent, and leadership reaching towards a time and a place where race won't dictate outcomes for people, families, and neighborhoods. So we welcome you to participate in any way you feel that it feels right for you. But I can guarantee two things, and I can hope for the third. One, you will meet amazing people on this journey. Number two, it will be incredibly frustrating. And third, my hope is that you will find it wildly worthwhile. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. I think this is my first public comment since becoming chair of the Woods Fund, and we fo I follow the terrific example and the big shoes that Amina Dickerson has uh, come before me. So um, Amina did a tremendous job, and she got us to this point. It's, it's our job now to take it to the next level. Let me tell you why I uh, care about TRHT. Were any of you uh, present yesterday at the Rainbow Push breakfast? If you were, kind of raise your hand. Just one person? or the rest of you are shy. Well, if you uh, weren't, let me just tell you, once in a while you uh, attend an event and the messages truly, truly resonate with you and they kind of go to the core of what you are and they kind of sound like things that you've been wanting to say, things that you've been writing, but then somebody does it better than you and is more articulate, and that's what happened to me yesterday. Uh, Brian Samuels, who has, I, I'm sorry, Brian Stevenson, who as you know is an award-winning uh, lawyer, civil rights leader, just kind of a voice, unofficial voice of this movement, if you will. He had uh, four messages that he gave, and I certainly cannot do it the way he did, but, but it reminds me of why we're here today in this room. So one of them, in thinking about uh, the, the work moving forward, civil justice work, human rights work moving forward, he said in order to do this well, in order to really get this work to resonate, there are four things that we ought to think about, four things that we ought to do. And one of the things is the first one for me, it's proximity. We need to get close to the people that we are going to work with and the people that we are going to serve, the people that we're going to listen to, and the people that are going to listen to us and work in partnership. That's the work that Woods Fund is trying to do uh, through TRHT uh, and the work that uh, we all are trying to do, get closer to the folks. It's too easy for us to just say, well, you know, the problems are on the south side, the west side, the northeast side, whatever side, the Latinos, the African Americans, the immigrants, the refugees. It's too easy to say we, have, we are contributing, but we are not present. So the first message was be proximate. Uh, the second one uh, was 
help us change the narrative. That's really at the core of this work as well. We need to change the narrative in this country. Um, so why don't people just get over slavery it's so long ago? We, we gave folks uh, the right to vote, both women, African Americans, others. Why don't we just get over it? Um, you know, people want to forget that this country uh, was founded with a lot of idealism, but then later it was kind of built on a genocide of a whole group of people that were here, and then the work of building this country was done on the backs of African Americans. Sure, certainly there were others, uh, but the African slaves certainly helped construct this country. We wouldn't be where we are today without that work. We don't acknowledge that. So we have to change the narrative. And then the narrative doesn't have to get that deep every day. Right? You have to pick your battles. But sometimes it's just easy narrative when people in your network say, those people, they are responsible for that. It's, it's our job to kind of change it there, just little, little things. Uh, the third message was stay hopeful. And that's um, at the core of what I think I've been trying to do for my entire life, uh, is just remain hopeful. Yeah, he called it our superpower. It is our superpower. At, at Metropolitan Family Services, every employee at our general office has kind of a superhero around their cube or, or uh, uh, in their office right by their door and they, everybody picks their own. I'm not gonna get you know, into the gangs of Marvel versus DC, uh, into that split, but everybody has their superhero uh, uh, and their superpower. So I just realized yesterday that my superpower is to be hopeful. Third one, and the last one, is to do uncomfortable things. You know, this work is going to force us to do things that are really, really uncomfortable. For Metropolitan Family Services, a 160-year-old organization kind of getting used to just doing the same old thing, uh, providing counseling, mental health services, workforce development, early childhood. Well, that's, that's not good enough. We need to get uncomfortable and do the work of helping to save lives. So that's why I do this work. That's why I'm here. I hope that you will join me as we move forward on this path. Thank you for being here. Primarily known as a poet, Harold is an ever-evolving artist with a skill set that the kind of defies categorization. His vibrant storytelling and his passionate lyrical delivery continue to captivate audiences, not only in the United States, but internationally. Uh, he's done repeat sellout shows at some of Chicago's largest and most popular music venue venues. Um, he's a really sought after talent but an equally respected band leader and event producer. Today really resonated with him, and we are very fortunate to have Harold Green with us. So please, everyone, put your hands together for Harold Green. What I like to do to open up my sets to kind of loosen up, because I know this is kind of a big professional situation right now. <laughs> <laughs> We make a lot of money and stuff, and I don't want us to kind of loosen up and be relaxed because that's not what I do. Okay, so uh, the thing I like to do to open up my sets is something called Lay of Life. And if anybody watches the professional uh, men's basketball, I'm going to say men, not to be sexist, but because those are people who usually don't. Um, you watch them and they lay up lines, they warm lines, they throw the ball on the backboard, catch with the elbow, and I'm going to lay it You watch those people because they seem very skilled and talented and have some skill set that everybody doesn't have. This is what this particular thing is right now. It's called the layup line. What I do, I ask for five words. You kind of raise your hand. I want to see you tell me a word. From those words, I try to create a piece. And then you can tell somebody later on in life I have a girl and everybody home. OK? So does that work for you? Is that everything OK? Yeah. In the back, is that all right? You all look at it all the way? Yeah. OK. So uh, let's get some words going. Can I have a word? Somebody give me a word. Somebody give me a word. You buy it. Somebody. Love. Love. Thank you so much. Somebody kiss it off. Yeah. Challenge, love, challenge, somebody in the back. There's somebody in the back. Let me get a word for somebody in the back. Joy. Joy, love, challenge, joy. There's three words, love, challenge, joy. Somebody over here. Voice. You said voice. Yes. Love, challenge, joy, power. voice, and power. power. Power, power. That was a good one. Love, challenge, voice, joy, and power. Okay, so one more time for me, not you. Love, power, challenge, voice. So this is a labor of love, a manual labor. 
laboring over words, definitions, sentences, paraphrasing, fragments, three-fifths, fractions, improper, the way we mix fractions and people. We've been whole, but whole people have power. Instead of divided, bipartisan, by people, the diaspora, the dichotomy, the way we try to switch our minds and code switch our language, the way we try to exist within your worlds and extract it from our worlds, put it inside of your worlds, and now my mind is in the twilight zone. I'm Alfred Hitchcock with another two pencil and pen. It's not a race school, so these words are permanent. This joy is permanent. When you see a smile, you can't erase that. No pencil can extract that. These words have placed joy inside of a world that has been flipped upside down. The prime meridian, the way we live in different hemispheres, the way my brain is divided when I step outside my door from the south side to the north side, from Eaglewood to Skokie. I have to exist where I'm not permitted. Even in, this, in the midst of all this adjudication and judgment, preferences from people who are not fractions. We are whole beings created by a master, but we serve no slave. We were not hit, met here, sent here to be no one's slave. Whole people, three-fifths, always searching for another two-fifths. Just so we can turn that joy into power. What a challenge to be shown love in a world that does not accept you as a whole person. Only fractions. This isn't geometry. This is biology. My genetics should never, ever determine my genetics, the way I move within this world. Philosophy, the way I use these words, should only do one thing bring us closer and not further apart. So I was real excited when I realized that this particular event was right there next to MLK Day. And then I got even more excited when I realized it was the 50th anniversary. And then it's like, oh my God, then it's on his birthday. Martin Luther King was and is one of my biggest heroes. When I was a kid, like I was an athlete and stuff like that. So I was looking Michael Jordan and all the other cool athletes, Bo Jackson and all that cool stuff. But Martin Luther King was somebody I wanted to be. So this day, that day is always very important to me. Like, I have my sons, like, listen to speeches from MLK and Malcolm Max and Sophie Carmack. All that was they only like nine and three, so it'd be like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I asked my son the other day, like, you know when you know, we listen to, because now he likes, like, entrepreneurial, like, podcasts and stuff like that. Like, you remember when you know, listen to speeches? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, whatever, you know. But you know, that type of stuff is important because when they get older and that foundation is already there, you don't have to like recreate, you know. But what's important to me is that people never forget how strong he was. I never want people to misunderstand nonviolence for men of honor, right? Because I think that sometimes with younger generation, they, they are like, you ain't throw no hands like that. No, you don't understand the type of power that man had to shut down agencies, to shut down foundations, to shut down corporations, that's power. And that's where this particular piece comes from. See, they want to be a play nice. But the city that I come from is frozen over by ice, cold looks that would have made Jack Frost think twice. These shorties aren't colors by police lights, the rhythm is by rolling dice, and they want me to play nice. Well, I hope these words y'all up in your head like a handful of lights. What's your head like a lead pipe? They want me to play nice. Why are these shorties listen to track rap every night? But you want me to talk about the essence of front essence. Why they said the heat is off their uncle's dresses. My young ladies and all these ladies on those Sunday dresses this in the wrong direction, but they want me to play nice. Well, I'm on my Vegas Ellis floor. They can meet me in my front door. They can go down if they wanted to. I'm on that balcony in Tennessee. I'm right here coming to get me. See, I'm from the same country they used to lynch me, and I'm a walking fool, being so put it being here with the leader of the army. I ain't calling no mention. I'm gonna lead it right there in the trenches. I'm trying to sign these words that lead. They want me to play nice, but I still play with words, or people still playing words with friends. I'm trying to find some words that lead, some words that defend. I'm the son of a sin, just waiting on my blessings to begin. 
but they won't get to play nice. Well, I've heard the king's speech and I've watched the throne. I know enough about royalty that you can't mislead me with the emperor's clothes. And of course you can make some clones because they don't know their origin and lack originality, but if you're going to mislead them and brainwash them, then so can I in the right direction. Now, we're just going to be battling. This is between you and I, and I'm the leader of the Justice League. You better be ready for some fatigue because I love a good fight. And no, I don't play nice. Like Martin knew. Martin knew he was about to die. He knew it was about to happen. And the pull is that he had, the power that he had to say, I know that this is coming. I'm going to walk out on that balcony anyway. I'm going to meet whatever it is you have coming for me. And you can't do nothing about what I've already done. That's power, man. That's scary. Yeah, that's scary. If you're not on that right side of history, if you're on the other side of that, that is scary. For somebody to have that much poise to say, I don't care what you're about to do. Look what I've done. You can't erase that. You can't change that. Look at that. 50 years later, you can't change that. You can't erase that. That's power. What he did in Chicago, what he did in the Midwest, what he did with the red bastards, to say, I'm going to clean on how you're shutting out AB. If you don't take these products off the shelves, we're going to change how you think about how you interact and react to us. That's power. Go back and listen to those words. Go back and read those words. Because if this be the heel that I die on, please, let it be down top. Let them hang from rooftops. Let them pop bottle tops in memory of me. Let it be grand. Let it not be plain or in vain or Sandra Bland. Let it not be black or Mike Brown, not white or Freddie Gray. Please don't let the fruits of my labor be stopped at Fruitvale Station. I'm still shocked that we haven't been saved by the shine bell. The fact that Trayvon Martin didn't get to meet his genius is a crime in and of itself. See, I don't want to be a martyr or a mural. One should have been enough. But the multiplicity of the plural is pitiful. The fact that you probably have 10 names that roll off the tip of your tongue right now that I haven't even mentioned is utterly ridiculous. And despicable me to think that I have concern for commerce to consume black trauma and be told that you can't cry if some wounds are self inflicted. As if you can't be predator and victim. As if you can't talk and listen, man, listen, if this be the hill I die on, then why can't it be a mountaintop? Why can't it be glorious? No more mole heels from being pigeonholed. No more sightseeing from bullet holes. The scope is too small. No more paranoia from peep holes. My vision's too big. You're too scared in your big home. They're too plush. Your carpet. You've forgotten how cold the concrete is when your head is pressed against it when you're easy before. What are you praying for? It must be nice. So only think about surplus and necessity. You not have to just ask to your baby back. You not have to be the designated prayer warrior because you're the only one left. I write because I'm still trying to figure it out. And sometimes these words are the only thing I have left. So we scream and we holler, we rage and we rally until nothing's left. And they scared, they shoot until there's nothing left. Empty the clip, rage on their gifts, scared of the clips, scared of the news clips, slaps on the wrist, we beat the list, we play the cycle all over again. If this be the hill I die on, then I swear to God it better be my own time. Let them know that I tried to reach peace and I didn't want to die in the valley of the shadow of death because in the shadows, monsters are created. And I refuse to be an American horror story while others get to live an American dream. How nice it must be to fail and fail again, to make mistakes and live to tell your savage story. To be served, Burger King, if you're dealing with but only serve 16 shots of the requirement down. See, you can't be a martyr if you didn't sign up for it. And no change comes from it, you're not a martyr, you're murdered. The language is important, isn't it? See, corrupt souls have deaf ears. So what a paradox and protest don't make a sound. So if this be the hill I die on, it better be a mountaintop before I hit the ground.
It's an honor to be in the Texas Center Center. Uh, it's an honor to continuously get calls from, from the museum. It's an honor that every time somebody walks in that Texas Center Center, they see me on that video and that people continuously got moved and motivated. But what's even more important is to be in a room full of people who are dedicated to making sure we move forward, to make sure that we continuously push the agendas, to make sure that we do not become complacent as a country, as a people, as human beings. It's an honor to be around people like that, because you're not always surrounded by people like that. So to know that when we leave this room today, whether it be the small things or the big things that we do, we're going to do something. And that's not something that everybody can say. And as you see, I'm obviously a big fan of MLK in his last piece, his inspired by him as well. That letter from Birmingham jail and reading it prompted me to write something. Because I think what always happens that we forget is that Martin was patient, he was always, but he was also always pushing it forward and always pushing the envelope. He didn't like people that were sad. He didn't like people that stood still while the world was moving. Because the places he can get the best of you. Being okay with okay. And mediocrity can get the best of us and the rest of us. See, the house is still dirty. You can clean up the best of you. My people were promised 40 acres and a mule, but we only settled after the donkey got beat by the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> See, pyramids were built by giants and plantations too, the beauty of the mind of the oppressed, beaten, but not broken. Never be broken. Only be a jackpot, be gold, never be a token. Never be confused by cynics. See, optimism is not hoping and wishing, it's knowing it's going and seeing and showing it's believing and being. It's knowing that you was promised greater and going to get it. It's seeing a brighter future in dark times and showing the blind. It's believing that dreams on divine conversation and being a personification of those divine conversations. See, optimism is not fluffs and frills. It's knowing that the yellow brick road is behind the lion's den, through the forest of attack dogs, under the monsoon of naysayers, over the mountain of supremacy, through the valley of death, but still lacing up your boots and saying, follow me. It's meeting the wisdom of Oz and telling him, you are not my God and questioning his alternative facts and standing on the shoulders of ancestors just to get a better view of heaven. Optimism is a verb. It's an action. It's the application of dreams. It's faith action plan. It's a little boy from the south side of Chicago who decided to write his way out without ever giving in. He saw the beauty in his city and his people and never shut up. You are looking at a lucid dreamer who decided to change his narrative, find pride in his heritage while never undermining another's, and still never succumb to mediocrity. Not as long as there's still black boys in this city that look just like me but never seen an optometrist, which means that optimism is a little bit blurry. Too much gunpowder packed up in the corners of their rappers, too many corners, too much survivors get. So sleep comes in the morning, or maybe never. Maybe never. Because nightmares become reality when your resources, your resources are as bleak as those who surround you. And imagine that's the type of people you're surrounded by on a daily basis. You want to be a light, but you're an isolated oasis. Then all of a sudden, the image is inverted, and it's no city for the introverts who speak now to the evolution piece. And how long can you be before you realize that pessimism is contagious? So either you're a warrior or you're a witness. And what's the point of waiting on the right time? The time you never waited on you. Life moves on with or without you. You might as well have to say it. So dreams are beacons of light. Dreams are light towers. And this world is made of oceans. And these waters are hard to navigate the dark. Some people can swim through those waters, and others are just waiting for you to shine your light so they can wade in the water. This is the light of the pie. Dreamers illuminate the night. That was a good piece of right. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> I don't know if anybody's
witnesses. That's what today is really about. Thank you so much. There was some, you know, I was over there without my pen and paper. <laughs> the mountaintop. Um, letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, I just hope you all recognize that we have a great talent here in the room with us. Hometown talent. Grown out of Chicago. And you will get to see him because he is the uh, he is uh, the voice of the production you're going to see this afternoon. So when you go in at 1.30, Harold is going to greet you, okay? And uh, I think it's a pretty powerful message. I, I got to see a little bit of it um, uh, just the other day, so you're in for a treat. So thank you again. Give it up for Harold. And remember, you saw him here first, right? So I am uh, now, we're going to, uh, with that inspiration, are we warriors or are we witnesses? Um, we have to recognize that a key component of truth, racial healing, and transformation is that word truth. Uh, and uh, in this regard, we're going to shift gears just a little bit uh, to learn about a recent report. I hope people have had a chance to flip through it. Uh, there were copies at the back, but we can share them, and certainly it's online as well. Um, I heard uh, this report um, sort of distilled last, I guess, June at a day-long conference, and it stayed with me, the tale of three cities of Chicago, where we are aggregating data that's already out there and looking at what that data is telling us about the changing conditions of racial and ethnic groups in Chicago during the last half century and of the systemic policies that have shaped our city. It's a sobering story. It's a real story. And here to present this, and this is a very tough, tough challenge that Amanda has, because if we spent a whole day distilling all of the data um, six months ago, what we've given her is almost an impossible task. And she is a scholar. She hails from the university. so. She likes to give you the information, right? So we're going to go through a lot of data in a little bit of time. As you're thinking, am I a warrior or am I a witness? Let the data wash over you and tell me if that doesn't make you a warrior. OK, without further ado, Amanda Lewis uh, from the University of Illinois at Chicago Center uh, or Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy. She's also, I should say, um, a professor of uh, sociology and of African American studies. So she brings a great deal of talent to, uh, uh, and skill uh, to trying to help us understand how we got to where we are. So Amanda Lewis. Thanks to uh, the Woods Fund, to Grace, to um, Jay for all the hard work today. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm not so grateful for is for putting me right after Harold, but um, <laughs> I know you all will forgive me. Um, so as the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, um, one of our central aims is to increase knowledge about the experiences and conditions of racial and ethnic groups, not just nationally, but locally, um, especially in the city of Chicago. And we started this project in part um, because we were interested in capturing the complicated truth about racial dynamics in our city today and really out of our own frustration with national narratives about Chicago that I'm sure many of you have seen in many places. And I should say also that we did this report with lots of different partners, um, too many to name, although one of our key partners, um, the Great Cities Institute, the director, Teresa Cordova, is here today. And she's also an author of a section of the report, so if you have other questions, she would be another good person to, to grab today. So we knew that um, the reality, so this is the, um, uh, so this is the story that we often see, 
right? That we are a city that's plagued by violence, although there's also a counter story that we are a city that is thriving, right? So these are these contracting poles. And what often doesn't happen is seeing the link between these two Chicago's, that, that these two things are inextricably linked. But the other part of the story about Chicago that is not often captured um, is the daily reality of hardworking young people trudging to school with heavy backpacks, parks filled with residents walking, playing, um, exercising, communities full of immigrants working overtime to make ends meet. Um, and yet we also knew that even as um, Chicagoans of all racial and ethnic groups want to live in safe and healthy communities, where they don't just subsist or survive but thrive, not all have equal access. And that is where the title of this report came from, A Tale of Three Cities. Because we found in the end there isn't one Chicago today but several. Um, in the report we primarily discussed the experiences of um, Chicago's three largest racial and ethnic groups. Latinos, uh, blacks, and whites. Um, we're nearing completion actually on a new report on Asian American experiences, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, but the central finding in the report is that the racial and ethnic inequalities in Chicago today remain pervasive, persistent, and consequential. Um, these inequities affect the lives of Chicagoans in every neighborhood. They have not just spatial, but also deep historical roots and are embedded in our social institutions and they have powerful effects on the lived experiences and opportunities of all Chicagoans. Facing this truth is for us, as Amina said, a key part, a key step of any healing process. As Baldwin put it, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. For many Chicagoans, healing from the long-term effects of structural racism involves not merely attention to social and emotional health, but about providing real and meaningful opportunities for families to thrive and live with dignity. So despite what you will read about in the national news, far more Chicagoans today, and this is another kind of key point, and I'm about to run through a bunch of data in my data nerd way, but one of the key realities that I want you to take away is that far more Chicagoans today are suffering and dying from the consequences of structural violence than are dying from interpersonal violence. Um, this is a quote from uh, Paul Farmer, who's a public health scholar. I won't read the whole thing, but it points to the idea that the conditions that many populations are struggling from that puts many of us in harm's way are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world, right? They're not just about um, other individuals putting people um, at harm. So I want to talk about a couple different domains. One of the domains in which we can see the persistence of the past into the present, about the way that we must continually today struggle, contend with, think about ways of offering redress for long, long histories of um, structural racism has to do with the way our communities are segregated. Uh, Richard Rothstein recently has gotten a great deal of attention for his new book, The Color of Law, which I highly recommend. Um, and like this report, it's not necessarily new, but trying to bring things together in a highly accessible way and to point out that segregation is not about the unintended consequences, the unintended effect of benign policies. It was an explicit racially purposeful policy that was pursued at all levels of government and therefore requires all of our engagement in deliberate strategies to think about how we contend with the reality that we collectively created. Redlining is just one off-sided example which had the consequences in practice of making black neighborhoods ineligible for federal housing administration loans at precisely the time that federal government was making the largest push in our history to make home ownership possible for working Americans. Consequently, black Americans in Chicago and elsewhere were for all practical purposes locked out of the greatest mass-based opportunity for wealth acquisition in American history history. That long history is embedded in homeownership patterns and the demographics of our neighborhoods. As you see, most of you probably know, we are leading the country on many aspects of housing segregation, but it's also in the organization of our schools and our healthcare systems. And in fact, across the sections of the report, we discover again and again that present day challenges we face stem from both the links of this past in the present and from present day um, discrimination. I'll just give you one example here. 
Um, the well-documented discrimination in the mortgage and banking industry, which yields pattern like this in Chicago of different racial groups having access to very different kinds of loans with very different kinds of costs associated with them and very different kinds of risks. This kind of pattern here, will you see that whites are far more likely to con get conventional loans than anybody else. Again, if you want to get into the weeds of what that means, more than details than you could possibly want are in the report. Um, but those are loans that are much more likely to be stable, um, don't have big jumps in payments over time, less risky, less expensive, et cetera. And that um, is from persistent, ongoing patterns of discrimination today. There was a lawsuit in the state of Illinois, um, Lisa Madigan against the Wells Fargo Bank not too long ago, precisely documenting many of these kinds of patterns. Okay. And the consequences of these patterns are many. I want to just point out a few other things. One is, so if we look at unemployment in the city of Chicago um, over the last 45 years, what we see is, is swings over time. But what you will also see in this data is at the moment in our history when we were declared most recently to be at the biggest financial and economic crisis, the point at which white unemployment was near 8%, right? That if you look for the, the numbers here for blacks and Latinos, their unemployment rates have never been at 8% over the last 45 years, okay? And in fact, at every stage, Latino unemployment rates are about twice, or at least one and a half to two times what white rates are, and that African-American unemployment rates are two to three times what white unemployment rates are. So our understanding of what a crisis looks like um, is quite fundamentally shaped by our expectations for different communities. Okay, another important point. We see Latino unemployment rates as lower than for other groups, but if we actually look at who is making a living wage, a majority of Latino workers in the city today are making less than $15 an hour, which is a standard that we might set as a kind of bare minimum for making a, a living wage. And in fact, fewer are making above $15 an hour now, adjusting for inflation, than was true 17 years ago. Um, okay, if, if you don't remember any other data point from this um, presentation, I want to just take a moment to talk about wealth gaps. Um, wealth gaps are basically take everything you own, all your resources, your house, your stocks, your whatever, subtract all your debt, that's your wealth. And what we find, this is the national data, we actually don't have perfect data locally to dig in on, but we see in the national data that this is one dimension of inequality that is deep, consequential, and actually worsening and uh, was one of the ones that was most impacted by the financial crisis of 10 years ago. So um, black-white um, wealth gaps, so whites have almost 20 times the wealth of average black families, Latinos, uh, whites have almost 18 times the wealth of Latino families. Um, that wealth differences is not about savings rates. I think people often see this and there's like, oh, you know, people need to save money, they need to put things away. This is about intergenerational transmissions of resources. That's what this reflects. This is about redlining. This is about opportunities within communities to accumulate wealth at key historical moments and then the ability to pass that along. And one of the most important data points when we look at this, and this is Chicago data, is how many families have zero or negative net worth. And that means how many fam families have absolutely a, a, a zero balance in their savings account or a negative balance. And part of the reason why this is so important, and you can see here for blacks and Latino families, it's about a third, is that it means do you have any safety net if any life circumstances arises that requires you to have access to even small amounts of money. And this has reverberations throughout a whole bunch of uh, different consequences. Um, I was thinking even around health, my daughter had a minor autoimmune thing that's been really having all kinds of challenges for us. We finally got a good diagnosis. We finally got, I had to go, go pick up the medication. It was $200, right? For some families that would just be impossible. Just a small thing like trying to figure out what's going on and trying to protect your kid. Okay, couple other, how am I doing? Okay, great, perfect. Okay, um, uh, let's talk about crime for a second, right? That's what we know about city of Chicago. I get calls from relatives randomly around the country. Are you okay? Are you safe? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. But here's what we know about city of Chicago, our crime, Data, we actually, our crime rates are actually lower than they've been in 30 years. Okay, that's what I tell. 
anybody who calls me. We're, we're doing just fine, thank you very much. It is true that our um, murder rate has not gone down as rapidly as other big cities. So it, we are not at our peak, right? Far too many people are dying on the streets. I'm not trying to say that's not true. Um, but we are not the murder capital of the country. There's at least 15 or 16, 17 other medium and large sized cities in the country that have larger, higher murder rates than we do. And it's this aberration that people often focus on. Why did LA and New York and other big, big cities go down and we didn't? We could talk about that. But really what I want to focus on is this. Our crime rates are going down dramatically over time. And this has not at all matched up with what's going on with our criminal justice system. We have been incarcerating more and more people in the state. It's a pattern that we see throughout the country. If you haven't read Brian Stevenson book, go read it. If you haven't read um, uh, the New Jim Crow, go read it. But the main point is here, within the state of Illinois, we have the most overcrowded prison population, state prison population of any state in the country. Yes, it is true. We are at 150% of capacity in the state of Illinois. We have 16,000 people in prisons that we don't actually have beds for. Okay, beyond, the, beyond what the prisons were designed for. Um, and that reality um, is impacting certain communities more than others. Um, we could really, I'm happy, to, anybody who wants to afterwards get into the weeds of where this all comes from and how it evolves, um, but it is an important reality um, that impacts certain communities more than others, and it has a huge impact on our state spending, which is often an easy, uh, an easy reality to, to uh, face, which is that we are spending lots and lots and lots of money on locking up nonviolent offenders from communities, particularly in the city of Chicago, and communities that are in dire need of other kinds of resources. Um, OK. Um, skip over those. I wanted to say two things about health. Um, uh, public health scholar David Williams um, often talks about the beginning of his talks about health disparities that every seven um, seconds a black person in this country dies who, who wouldn't if black and white health um, were equal. That's over 200 people a day who would not die if the health of black and white communities was equal. Um, and what we know about public health data in the city of Chicago, it's actually worse than national patterns and going in the wrong direction. And this is not about genetic differences between group, groups. This is about how race gets into our bodies. It's about stress. It's about toxins. It's about access to care. It's about all of these things. So again, in, in, we look at these things across several domains. But as in the story I told about my daughter a minute ago, when we look at health disparities, those health disparities are linked to economic disparities and community access and all of those other things. OK. The reverberations of our collective racial history, as I talked about at the beginning, along with persistent patterns of racism and discrimination today, yield stark patterns of inequity we can't ignore. We can all do better. Right? This call to be warriors and not just witnesses is for real. And our commitment to a collective sense of responsibility, our commitment to everyone in the city of Chicago and in our region is going to be key to making headway on these kinds of challenges. We all need to feel a much greater sense of collective responsibility um, in order to begin facing these realities, facing these truths that are a key part of our, our narrative. Um, we are, there's lots of other kinds of programmatic um, and policy change that we could talk about to address these particular things. But I think uh, throughout the day, we'll have lots more time to, to grapple with these things. So thanks very much. Amazing job. And I have to just say, you should, if you have the copy, Please take time to go through it and to distill further for yourselves uh, the data that is there because it is, um, well, it's very sobering. And it, it, again, calls into this question, are we going to be witnesses and just see this data and not take action, or are we going to be warriors? So we have time for a couple of questions, yes? With my two questions. Um, and I just want to point out, uh, once again, some of the issues that were raised around uh, the patterns of discrimination, 
the astounding, stunning information about the wealth gap. Uh, we didn't even really get an opportunity to go into the health data deeply and understand what the removal of trauma centers, for example, out of so many neighborhoods and the impact that that has on our young, young people and on their families. Housing, we know that's a very old story didn't even touch on education and the investments in education. All of this is in the report. And I've heard this now, some version of it, three times. And I'm still stunned by it every single time I hear it. So let's have a couple of questions. And as I said, Amanda is going to be here. It, it's still going to be a little bit of time. I think we need another day. I keep, I keep trying to say we need another conference like you had last year so we can distill this. OK, first hand I saw, second hand I saw. And maybe we can squeeze in three if they're quick questions. Questions, not comments. Um, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best with all three, and then we can have, have more conversation. Um, in terms of the decline in the black population um, in the city and in the state, I think um, you know, we are continuing an ongoing set of conversations to try to understand exactly why, how it's unfolded. I think you can't think about it without connection to policy changes, things like the, the plan for transformation, about what the, um, the changes in public housing rules in the city, et cetera. Um, I think when we look at communities that have experienced dramatic forms of disinvestment over the last few decades, I think there's lots of reasons why you might understand um, uh, folks leaving the city. Um, you know, it's one of the interesting things when, when I was, when you just finished the report, I got a call from a reporter in San Francisco who said, oh, I heard the black population in the city is declining. Is it like San Francisco? It's gentrification. People are getting displaced. They're, they're getting pushed out of their neighborhoods. And I said, that's really not the story of African Americans in the city of Chicago today. If we look at the vast south side, that's a story about disinvestment. It's a story about people trying to find affordable places to live. And when we think about gentrification and displacement, that's really going on far more in Latino communities in the center of the city. Pilsen, Humboldt Park, Logan Park. So there's really different things going on um, in different communities. And I think for a lot of people, the question is, is this a city, is this a state that has their interests at heart? Um, and that would be a set of questions I would ask. I think the murder rate, um, OK, I'm, so, I'm going to sort of give you a non-answer, unfortunately. One is, I think we've, I, I don't want to minimize what it means to be in a community and there, and there are, are several communities in the city that are experiencing high rates of violence. I don't want to minimize what it means to live and try to raise children and all those things in those communities. I think what's troubling to me about the focus on it in certain ways and the way it's been focused on is we get a continuation of a kind of racialized narrative about violence that I think is one that justifies certain kinds of, continues to justify certain kinds of fear, certain kinds of criminal justice policies and certain things that don't actually serve those communities very well. The same communities that are experiencing high rates of, of violence, the murder rates, et cetera, are also communities that are experiencing high rates of police violence, right? And so I think for a lot of the folks in those communities, the idea that what we need is more police is not necessarily something that makes people feel more safe, right? So there's this real tension about what does it mean to try to think about how to, how to really provide people with safe communities, right, where they can, where they can grow up. So that, I, I understand that I'm sort of ducking you, but that's where I'm going to go. Um, in terms of the, the data on um, American Indians in the city, you know, so as I said, we acknowledged very clearly in the report there were certain limitations to, to our strategy. Um, we initially looked at the data um, both for Asian Americans, for Amer uh, American Indians, for Arab Americans, for other key groups in the city that are smaller but also have long and complicated histories. And of course, you can't think about the history of Chicago and any story about displacement, genocide, et cetera, without thinking about the history of um, American Indians in this um, community. But the, in terms of, and this is just a kind of data nerd moment, is that trying to, across all these domains, deal with the complexity of these different communities meant that um, the, the, again, it needed its own attention, let's put it that way, that the story was more complicated, that the story involved, um, you know, what you would see in most of the graphs that you have in that table, all these little little bars on the side that wouldn't tell you very much. So we've 
committed to a process of trying to do supplemental reports about smaller but growing, smaller but important groups in the city, and I'm happy to talk more about that effort. As I said, we're about to, um, we're in conversations with Metropolitan Family Services, actually in great cities and others about, about issuing this Asian American report, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about, about the patterns there. Again, really important, complicated, counter to many of our narratives. We, you know, we have a, native, a narrative about Asian Americans as a kind of model minority or doing so well and education and that thing. And what we find really is a story where immigration policy has meant that we have um, admitted into this country the most educated uh, uh, folks from certain countries, right? It's far more educated than the folks in, the, in their country of origin. Um, and on the other end, we have families coming through family unification policies and through refugee policies who are really struggling socially and economically in the city. And none of that is captured well in a kind of flat narrative about Asians as a kind of model minority who are somehow, that we're all supposed to learn from in terms of commitment, you know, we, you know the kind of tiger mom narrative that we all get. Again, I could get into the weeds with any of this. As you can probably tell, I could talk for an hour about all of that. Um, so I invite you to come talk more um, at lunch and have it effect. Thanks very much. Give it up for Amanda Lewis. We've invited three very distinguished um, upstanders. I have to tell you that when I saw this word in my script, I had I struggled with upstander. I spent about 20 minutes looking to see if I could find another term, but I understood what they meant. These are people who are the warriors. These are people who are the drum majors, who are on the front line. So I'm thrilled to um, introduce the following distinguished guests. Um, first, we're going to have uh, State's Attorney Kim Fox, uh, followed by uh, Rami Nashim, uh, I should know Rami, uh, he's Rami to us, uh, but Rami Nashashibi and Chancellor Juan uh, Salgado. They don't really need introductions, but here we go anyway. Kim Fox. Hi, Kim. Hi. How are you? Sister girlfriend moment, okay. Um, Kim is the first African American woman to lead the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, the second largest prosecutor's office in the country. Kim was elected to the top post after claiming victory in uh, what we all remember as a very historic election during a very, very critical time uh, in uh, our discussions, debate, struggle around our criminal justice system here in the United States, and I mean in Chicago. Uh, Kim's message was one of reform, restoring trust, and working with the community to increase public safety. Uh, and it resonated with diverse citizens across the county who wanted to see change and fairness enter uh, our criminal justice system. I'm sorry, y'all. I have new braces. I'm still getting used to them, okay? I'm just gonna confess my sins straight out. So we, okay? Thank you for sharing. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. So you'll, you'll know what's going on with me. Um, Rami, we are so proud of Rami. Rami, woo we have a certified 2017 MacArthur genius on the house, okay? Rami has a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and has taught courses at multiple universities uh, since that time, recently completing a three-year teaching gig with the Chicago Theological Seminary. In 2016, President Barack Obama, the last great president, <laughs> my president, 44, I stopped there, 44. Um, but he was appointed uh, to uh, serve on the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And Rami also serves on the board of the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Those of us in the foundation world know that Casey is out there doing great work uh, in a very innovative and, and uh, continuous and sustained fashion. Um, and he's an advisor to a number of strategic initiatives around the country, lest you thought he spent all his time in Chicago. It's national. Um, his work with Iman continues to feature in many national and international media outlets. And finally, our brother, Chancellor uh, Juan Salgado, uh, who's been at City Colleges now for what, six months? Eight months. And you're still there to tell the tale. <laughs> okay. Um, 
And he oversees the community college system that serves more than 80,000 students from seven colleges across our city. Juan has focused all of his 20-year career on improving education. And those of you who know Juan know his commitment is real, it's strong, and it comes from the place of his heart. Uh, he's also very concerned with economic opportunities being provided for residents in low-income communities. He's been nationally recognized for his work. And guess what? We don't have one. We have two MacArthur Fellows in the house, OK? 2015. I guess they're brother geniuses or something. I don't know. I'm going to try and sit between both of them at lunch and see if something happens. In any event. Um, in all seriousness, we're here to hear their stories. You know, we always see the outer story. What's the inner story? What's the one that really helps shape them? What is the thing that drives them to be warriors? And so without further ado, we're going to start with Kim. So Kim, if you don't mind. It is really an honor and privilege to be here with you all this morning to not talk uh, policy, though sitting through the last presentation, it whets your appetite for what you already know how gut-wrenching and heart-wrenching it is. Um, I took from that, as someone who works in the criminal justice system and knows some of those numbers and knows about the crime rates and the prison incarceration rates, the impact on communities of color, um, and knowing the issues of housing discrimination having grown up in our projects, and all of that data, um, it's a privilege to not talk about it from the landscape of a political scientist or a policymaker but what it feels like to have lived that experience, or what it feels like for people to live that experience. And very often, you don't get a chance to talk about what it is in that experience that drives you to do this work. Um, as my intro said, I am the first African-American woman um, to be elected to this position. I'm the second African-American to serve in this position, Cecil Parti having been appointed back in 1989. And I'm often asked about why would you want a position um, in which involves so many people who look like you and come from neighborhoods like yours uh, to be a prosecutor in a criminal justice system that has the numbers that you see here today. I was asked that when I first became a prosecutor and I'm often asked now. Uh, and it is a troubling question for me because I wholeheartedly believe in the principle that was said earlier by Harold, why witness a system that does such harm um, and not be a warrior advocate from within to dismantle that which you know is harmful. Um, that's why I'm here. But let me take it back for a moment. Many of you may know, because I talked about it uh, everywhere that I went. I grew up in the city of Chicago. I come from the projects of Chicago. I am a project girl. My husband is from the suburbs, so I stopped saying that, um, <laughs> because I frightened him because I'm a project girl. Um, and there's something very proud. When you talk to people, again, if you look at the housing statistics about the segregation, there's a real sincere pride of people who grew up in public housing in this city. There's this notion that somehow we were impoverished of values, impoverished of love, that somehow we believe that we were not worthy enough. It was completely the opposite. I cannot go down the streets of Chicago and run across someone who either came from Kareem, where I'm from, who shouts out their building, or came from Robert Taylor, or came from Ivy Wells, and will shout out their neighborhood, shout out their building, because there was a tremendous sense of pride of who lives in those neighborhoods. When I grew up in Cabrini, I lived with my mother, who was 18 when she had me, and I was her second child. My brother is 13 months older than I am. My mother was one of five daughters. All of us lived in Cabrini. My grandmother took care of my mother and me and my brother and my cousins for a number of years because, as you may well imagine, if, where you were at 18, 19, 20. Uh, my mother's focus was not always on my brother and I first and foremost. And I say that not with judgment, but with the realities of what it's like being a teen and being a teen parent. In Cabrini, everybody looked like you, right? And it wasn't an anomaly for my mother to be a young mother. My friend, we would make fun 
and talk about people's parents who needed um, like geriatric type medicine. I forget what it's called. But we made fun of the parent that was like 32 um, <laughs> because they were old. And then the mother uh, of a soon to be 15 year old, 12 year old, and 45. I regret every hurtful thing I said <laughs> about a non-teen parent. Um, but everybody looked like me. We came from the same circumstances. We all appreciated each other's families. We knew that we were black because it was very much apparent and obvious. It was wholly black in the building that I was in, totally. Perhaps the only flex of people who were not looking like us came from law enforcement, from police officers who may, who may respond to something, maybe an occasional teacher. But there was no question that we were black. And I think it took me a while to realize that we were poor because everybody had the same stuff. So I felt like we were rich enough in experience that we never felt like we were lacking from our neighbors. And the question that was asked of me was, when was that moment that you realized that your race set you apart? And it wasn't in the rain, because everybody there came from the same tribe. When I was in third grade, we left the rain, and we went one mile north to Lincoln Park, to Old Town, um, which is very different. We could not afford it. I was eight years old. So my mother had to be about 24, I'm sorry, 26. And she knew that the educational opportunities in Old Town and Lincoln Park were very different than the isolated education that we had in Korea. Again, when you look at those statistics and you look at the educational disparities and you look at the housing disparities, I mean, living is body of that. When I got to Lincoln Park, I went to LaSalle and Academy, which is one of the finest schools in the city of Chicago, and continues to be one of the finest schools in the city of Chicago some 30 plus years after I graduated there. And the schools that were in Cabrini, well, Cabrini is now gone, Skinner, or, which is apparently one of the finest schools in the city of Chicago, was Sinner Troop when I was there, and it was not. When I got to LaSalle, my brother and I were part of a minority of students. Uh, there was, it was largely, uh, white, largely um, more middle class affluent uh, students who were there. And even in those moments where I had seen enough people who looked different from me on TV, I watched enough Grease Company to know that the old haircut um, was to be expected from some white boys, um, I would seen enough where I wasn't even shocked by kind of the, the initial physical disparity between the two of us. We, I knew that. Um, and I also knew when you go into neighborhoods that you are not the majority, you are armed with kind of an armor from your family, from your community. I will tell you, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, all of us told us you are black. And what that means, and, and everyone's gonna deny who's heard the story, you have to work how hard? Twice as hard. To get how far? Half as far. So I got that speech, that people aren't going to expect you to do well. You're going to be challenged. They're not going to think that you're good enough. And you're putting that on a third grader. You're putting that on children, where you are arming them up. And it wasn't to deflate us. It was so that we could endure. I imagine that my mother sending us out into a universe that she knew would reject us because the statistics tell us that we would be rejected but you go anyway armed with the expectation that people will not expect much of you. And no one has said anything to me. I've never had that encounter. But my mother prepared me for what it was like for a dominant population to think I was nothing. And I wish that I could tell you that that exercise, that ritual of preparing your children to go out into that world stopped with me, even though I don't live um, in public housing anymore and I live in a middle class neighborhood, I arm my children with the exact same speech. Because I can't afford not to. Because I look at those numbers otherwise. But even with that having been armed, I remember thinking, laughing, playing with the same kids who had the same hopes and had the same dreams, played the same games that I did, that we were very much 
alike. They had better snacks at their house. Um, and by better snacks at their house, they had things that we didn't have, and I was more conscious, not so much of my race, but of my poverty. It wasn't so much that I thought that they were better because they were white, I just knew that they had money. And sometime in my head, I think I equated that money and race were combined. But it wasn't until, and I think I was easier accepting the economics than the race. The moment that my race and the lowered expectation of who I was that was pushed on me, that I was prepared for, but that you could absolutely never be prepared for, is when I had the audacity to say that I wanted to run for a grade class president. I was audacious way back then. <laughs> And I knew uh, that it would be uh, fun because you got to write posters, you got to like hang out and socialize when you're trying to get votes. Um, and I was very excited. I didn't have a real platform. I just wanted to be the person. Just <laughs> <laughs> wanted to be boss. <laughs> and I will never forget my. We had librarians back in schools back in the day. We had a librarian, Mrs. Samuel who came to me one day and said to me, and I was running against a young man in Aaron Building. Aaron's father was a lawyer, his mother was a homemaker. Aaron's father had argued at the US Supreme Court. Um, Aaron's father, Aaron's family was a you know thing. And it was me and my crew who were taking on him. <laughs> and Mrs. Samuels pulled me to the side one day and said, why are you doing and I thought she meant, what was my platform? And I was trying to think on my feet. And she said, you don't belong here. And at that moment, I thought, in the library? Um, <laughs> and I think the stunned look on my face, and she said, we let you all come to this school. And then you believe that you can take things over. And I have to tell you, it wasn't like a kid who called me a nigga on the playground, because then you could just push them down. Mm -hmm. I know I, I would just, you know, handle that. <laughs> <laughs> it is very different when someone who's in a position of authority, a teacher, a librarian, a, to me, a keeper of books and wisdom and knowledge, in a building that's supposed to bring and seek the best of you and what you could be. And everything that my mother had prepared me for, I was able to say, that didn't happen to me. I have somehow escaped that. That woman, that teacher, that educator, that librarian, told me I didn't belong. And I dared not expect myself to be as valuable as the white boy that I was fighting against. And I was crushed. Because what that told me wasn't that just Miss Samuels said this horrible thing to a child, but she was part of a system and a structure that I did see myself as one of the only in the classes I was in. I was in honors English, and honors math, and honors Spanish, and I was the only one there. And in that moment, I thought to myself, they don't want me here. And maybe that's why the rest of them aren't here with me. That recognition of that is why everywhere I go, I talk about being a black woman. I talk about being the first in this space, part of the system and an institution that has historically witnessed people who look like me and my mother and my brother and my cousins and my uncle falter with the expectation that, that that's what we deserve. I tell people all the time that if you looked at my history, if you looked at my risk factors, there was no doubt that the expectation is that I would end up in our criminal justice system. You just didn't think I would be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Salaamu <laughs> alaikum, peace and blessings, shalom, ashe. 
uh, perhaps the second greatest injustice of the day. Uh, I have to follow Pale Greens. I have to follow Pale Greens. <laughs> but you joked about sounding like God, but I would definitely say there was a divinely ordained trajectory to see this sister in the position she yeah. is now. So let's do it once again. So, I also struggle with the word upstander, but I guess I came to think about it in the context of the types of magical, mighty mentors and moments that I think I could have related to in my life that has challenged me to aspire towards this idea of not just, I think, standing up with, but also standing up occasionally against. I'll say more about that later. But perhaps one of those moments for me in my life story uh, starts as a 10-year-old. I'm uh, with my younger seven-year-old brother and my mother on a very luxurious, uh, luxurious, uh, well air conditioned tourist bus crossing over a small tiny bridge named after a early uh, English field imperial field marshal by the name of General Allenby, otherwise known as the Allenby Bridge, crossing over the River Jordan, a small sliver of the river. It's not a biblical story, I promise. <laughs> but as I cross over, I'm on a bus with my brother and my mother, all carrying the big blue American passports, and on this bus we're all comfortably sat alongside others who are carrying Western European and American passports. Immediately as we cross over from Jordan into what was Israel to be processed as folks coming into the country, I look over on the other side of the processing center and see raggedy looking buses backed up for at least half a mile with what looked like hundreds of people standing around waiting to be processed. I asked my mother at that moment, who are they? Some of them looked a lot like us. She said, those are folks that don't have your passports. In other words, other Arabs and from other parts of the world with those types of documents. And as a 10-year-old, there was a moment of relief, slight tinge of guilt, but I got over it real quick. Just really happy and content to be, thank God I'm on this side of the processing center. As we got down from the bus and entered into the station, we, we were quickly told, immediately after showing our documents, when they looked at my brother and I's last name, to sit with my mother in the back of the station. And we sat watching all of our fellow tourists who were on the bus being processed until there was absolutely no one left on that side of the station. They then called us forward and started going through every aspect of what we had in our suitcase over and over again till finally the soldiers, after they were done with going through and x-raying at least two or three times every single thing we were carrying, looked to my mother and said, ma'am, we're going to have to go take the children. Oh. Now, a little backstory for my mom. My mother was born a child, the eldest child, and two refugees. And, but it was really Palestinian refugees, but she was really a South Side girl brought up and raised in neighborhoods from Inglewood to South Shore to Marquette Park. 
And not unlike him, had been in a couple of fights or two. <laughs> and had the same type of natural response I think anyone would have when they're told by soldiers packing and losing some machine guns that we want you to take your children to be scripts so that you're 10 and 7 year old. Which is, lay your effing <laughs> hands on my children and you will see what happens. So all of a sudden, my mom is erupting into this chaos in the station while by force we are taken from her and told to strip down to our underwear. My brother was shivering and I, in my best attempt, tried to comfort him. Horrified, mortified, I remember those moments in different ways, in different moments of my life, but I certainly always remember coming back to my mother who, after screaming her head off, was then bawling. Hmm. Confused, because I saw another young Sephardic Jewish soldier who looked, again, a lot like us, comforting my mother. And I was both in my own 10-year-old capacity and rage, but also relieved that someone was there with her. Ten years later, fast forward, I, after living all over the world, my mother also as a backstory had gone through a messy divorce but was a businesswoman, independent woman, and traveled and married again, and I was growing up in different parts of the world, and ended up ironically back in the same neighborhood that she had last been before she met my father and moves overseas where I was born in Marquette Park where I was organizing and working and engaging. But before doing any of that work, that first summer that I found myself back to the United States, and although never grown up here, I had always been familiar about stories of Chicago, but realized immediately, 10 years later, that I was completely unprepared to deal with issues of segregation and race. All I knew that those moments as a child had profoundly informed who I was and who I thought I was. That moment of separation, of seeing myself differently from that group of people, I was reminded on that trip that I was someone else, irrespective of my passport. And so I grew up obsessed with my connection to a struggle between Palestinians and Israelis and saw myself through that prism, and almost exclusively through that prism. I remember, in fact, my first summer out of college, I was working on a campaign was trying to raise awareness about certain tax dollars and military occupation. And with me was assigned Talk about a moment, now talk about a mentor, a former panther, a brother who kind of looked at me from the side of this, kind of trying to take me in, processing my hyper enthusiasm <laughs> to do all these things. <laughs> Just trying to calm me down. His name was James. He was, James was assigned this you know, 19 year old, just frenetically crazy dude to try to deal with me and give me some structured program. And throughout that summer, the program was just to follow James <laughs> and just to sit. But I learned that James had to just temper my perspective. And James opened up a whole other world to me about seeing my experience and understanding the links between experiences took me from Humble Park to talk to me about the models and the disciples and the vice lords and took me into those neighborhoods and met all the various folks and people that were warring with one another at the time, but more importantly, sat me down and gave me and exposed to me a way in which I saw my story connected to not only James' story, but to the story of other communities. And it was a defining moment by a mentor. And in fact, that really helped to shape me not only in those experiences, but also to do what I think a lot of us are doing in this room and have been doing through this process, appreciate and think about stories very differently. You know, it was in that process of becoming more organized that the stories of people like Rabbi Robert Marks and my completely different orientation to a different aspect of the Jewish American, uh, American, Jewish American experience forward me. Because for the first time, I'm now learning from Jewish American organizers about the process of not just standing up, 
But this idea of also standing occasionally very courageously against. I read about the moment that Rabbi Marx was assigned as a congressional rabbi to observe the marches in places like Marquette Park. And I, and, and I was later mentored by Rabbi Marx about the courage that it took to stand not only as an observer, but to then courageously and lovingly challenge all the Jewish congregations who empowered him with that goal to say that on August 5th, 1966, which was a Shabbat nonetheless, to say that I cannot stand and observe as an observer. There's only two sides of the street today. They're standing with the marchers or it's standing against them. And I can't believe in everything that I believe in the Talmud and the great rabbinic text and justify standing on one side versus the other. And so it was Rabbi Marx and it was the likes of people like Imam Muhammad and it was the likes of organizers and mentors in various faith communities that taught me what the Quranic injunction in, in our scriptures talk about that says, Kunu kawamina bin be people who stand for justice, without an anusikum, even if it means standing against yourselves. You know, it was powerful being in this space today, and today is my first visit to this extraordinary institution. I feel humbled and honored that I'm here. Two weeks ago, I was actually at Yad Vashem for the first time. And as I went through those exhibits and viscerally connected with the profound types of terror that people uh, had undergone through one of the most horrific moments in modern history. I left shaken as I walked out. I was also, interestingly, armed with a piece of paper, an old map from my grandfather, who asked me before he left, my 91-year-old grandfather that raised my mom on my south south side, to find this house in my hand in his old village in 1948, a village by the name of Ain Ket, that I find overlooks, that is, you can see when standing on the very balcony of the Yad Vashem Memorial. So I walk from the Yad Vashem Memorial down the valley to the village, armed with this piece of paper and a little red mark that my grandfather said to a, what is now a trendy artisan village to try to find my grandfather's house. And finally, I think I found what I thought was the closest thing to his house, took a picture so I could bring it back to him. And as I walked back that day, I thought about the words of King, thought about this idea when you talk about being part of an inescapable network of mutuality, that our pain and our stories are connected. And you talked about this in the context of a single garment, that we are part of a single garment of destiny. I didn't talk about it as the most luxurious garment, the most uh, comfortable garment. In fact, as you can think about it as you know, a little tattered, uh, uh, tarnished, and even tore up. But it's still one garment. It's still one future. It's still one reality that we all share. And I believe that part of what this process both has taught me and even the process that we're involved in that understanding each other's stories, connecting to each other's stories, seeing our stories in one another, whether it's my grandfather who can now identify with the Tunisian Sephardi Jew that happens to be living in his house who underwent extraordinary pain to have to flee his family and can actually forgive him for being in his own house. Or whether it's those of us who come and take the reality of the statistics that we were presented to say none of us are completely innocent of the realities that we all inhabit here in a city like Chicago. We're all implicated one way or the other. We're all part of that destiny. I pray and hope that the work that we're doing, that all of the extraordinary privilege that I've been afforded throughout the life, my life will continue to be part, and much of it from people in this room Will we continue to be afforded to the organizers and to the leaders that are leading us, I believe, into a, a reality that we will all ultimately understand is better for all of us where our connections and our futures 
and our realities are in fact mirrors of what one another and challenge each of us to come to that fact. I would close with saying that there is a song we heard from our extraordinary artist, our brother Green, Harold Green today. Um, I would also throw out another artist who I think just produced a track that should be a theme song for the type of work in another South Side Chicago artist by the name of Vic Mensa, mm -hmm. right? Who has a track that I would encourage all of us to listen to about um, the ideas of coming together if we could be free. And one of the lyrics said, if I could be free, if we would only understand that we are slaves to one another's stories and oppression, right? if we can understand that, we could be free. If we can be free, I would also be prepared to bleed for one another if we could be free. So with those words, with that, I really appreciate it. Thank each of you. start by sharing an appreciation for uh, community and the community that we build mm -hmm. day by day, hour by hour, relationship by relationship. And um, I think that's what's so powerful about today, right? And also probably powerful about my own experience. Um, it's hard to, I'm sorry, they're talking about my name. It's hard for me to separate today <coughs> myself from my name. My name is now introduced as Juan Sacada. I was named after my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather, Juan Juanito, was my mother's father. Uh, we're the fifth or sixth children, so it took my mom five children to get the opportunity to name one of the children, right? <laughs> <laughs> after her father. Um, my older brother, Dan, was named after my father and three other sisters. And uh, the reason I say that is that for the first 21 years of my life, I couldn't remember being called Juan. It just wasn't the name that I used on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the first 21 years of my life, my name was John Salgado, mm. Johnny Salgado, mm. John Sal, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and and that's just the way it was. <clears throat> you know, it was that way because where I grew up, every Latino's name was their name, you know? Enrique Martinez was Henry. My cousin Jorge was George, right? Go on the line. You just didn't go by your name. It's not what was done. It's not the way it was. And so my mother, who's coming from Mexico, you know, was told by the other women in the community that you go by first name, that's the English name. You don't go by the actual name. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's what she did. Uh, and I can't tell you I didn't like it, okay? I can't tell you I didn't like it. You know, there was something about being, you know, similar to what everybody else was doing that was quite comfortable. It was something that helped me to be a part of it. I mean, I didn't grow up in a Latino community. I grew up on 125th and National Avenue. I grew up in what was a white working class community. Mine, my family, all Latinos, we live on National Avenue. And if you go there today, you'll see it's surrounded by apartment buildings. We were actually homeowners, the way we could be homeowners. Uh, it was about 10 to 12 to 16 people living in the house at any given time, right? And, uh, and around us were mostly white working class folks. People that could make enough to pay for an apartment, but not enough to actually own a home. And as I was going through school, my community actually shifted from a white working class community to an African American community. If you go there today, it's a primarily African American community, just out of the city, right on the park. And so, um, and so this was quite, I just say, comfortable, okay? And that's really important in some respects. But my family, well, like my mother said, we're not gonna, or my father said, we're not gonna honor our culture. In fact, my mother gave Spanish classes at school in home. So we would learn our language. My father demanded that we speak the Spanish language in the home. Uh, you know, 
my father started an organization called Latin Americans for America in the community to really push for and improve the community, uh, putting our brand as Latinos sort of out front. And so I had really good role models growing up about what we ought to do and how we ought to live. And yet, you know, part of the narrative that we had in our home is, you know, look, you know, you know, there are some things that are just that way, right? I remember when African Americans were moving in, my mother saying to us, it's wrong what people say about the African Americans moving. Dijo, está mal. And she would go through all of the reasons why in scripture and otherwise it was wrong. But she also would say, hey, cuidado. <laughs> be careful. It's a tough society. Okay? Um, and so you didn't quite know what to do. Whether to speak up or just be around. It's not just for me, that was for lots of folks. And I'll say that, you know, um, I have an older sister, Reyna. She went out to school in California. And uh, I went to visit her once. And it was a really interesting visit. She's a teacher like, no, like, like teachers ought to be, teaching uh, bilingual students. Uh, that uh, are farm workers in Northern California. And uh, in her vision of being a teacher, you work the fields during the summer so that you get to know your students and their families, so that you can help build the relationships to help them to you know, strive and overcome and do well uh, in their lives. And I remember going and visiting her, uh, I was younger, and remembering a couple things, you know. One, that unlike Chicago, you know, in Northern California, there were very few African Americans. There were many, many uh, Latinos working in these fields. And none of them had taken really the name that I had taken. They had their names. They had very little bit of anything else. But they had a lot of pride in who they were. They had a lot of connection to who they were. And they had a lot of belief, even in the toughest of circumstances, that things can and will get better. Um, and I remember being impacted by that. But also understanding you know, that there's sort of a pecking order that happens in society. In Northern California, there weren't many African Americans. And so I honestly felt as an 18, 19 year old kid, say, geez, you know, Mexicans out here are being treated like African Americans get treated back home. And the Filipinos that were around, they act like Mexicans back home. <laughs> and it got me a thinking. And I wasn't a very conscious person. You know, the use the word upstanders. I was definitely not an upstander. You know, I was definitely a bystander. Mm -hmm. By all accounts, I was a bystander. On many issues, I was a bystander. We are full of people all across this nation that are bystanders. Some of it realize it. Others don't even know it. They're indifferent to it all. It's one of the most dangerous things we face. Is people don't understand the lack of consciousness. And I certainly didn't understand it. But I got to a point in life where, of all things, my name began to matter to me. I no longer wanted to be John or Johnny or Johnny Settle. I wanted to be Juan. But Juan wasn't just a name for me. It was a different way of thinking. It was a different way of being. It was about caring a whole lot more, not just for myself, 
but for the people around them. It was about being part of a community, being present, speaking up. I got these wonderful opportunities. I remember uh, spending some time volunteering in East St. Louis, Illinois. Got a chance to meet a wonderful leader, a courageous leader, Catherine Dunham, who was on a hunger strike trying to call attention to the treatment of Haitian immigrants, the relative treatment of Haitian immigrants to Cuban immigrants. And she said to me, you are Latino, yes. Go back to your campus. Speak about the Haitian immigrants. Talk about this injustice, this indifferential treatment, this pecking order that exists. And boy, did it hit home. It hit home. Because there's a thing about human nature that we need to end, right? That somehow some of us always find a reason to be better than others. And yet we are no different. We are all the same. We are all human beings. We are all born to be cared and loved. That's the kind of name I want to honor my mother with. The kind of human being she always raised us to be. Against the current of a society that often teaches children something different than what their parents would hope they would learn. And yet to honor my mother, to honor the name she gave me, I decided to live my life in a way that if my mother were watching me every single day, at every single hour, my mother would say, that's a son I could be proud of. Because that's an action that I would support. And so when I graduated from college, my undergraduate degree, and it was sitting right in front of me, Every other degree I had gotten was John Salgado. My driver's license, John Salgado. My credit cards, John Salgado. My identity, John Salgado. I made a conscious decision, right, to be that human being and to go by my name, the name that my mother had given to me. And it seems like, you know, what's the big deal? Well, for each one of us, right? Um, for each one of us, you know, there's something there where we have to make a conscious decision. We either going to turn on to helping be a part of a community, a beloved community. We have to be a part of it. We have to make that conscious choice. And we have to make it under every, other, every day. And I say every day, every day because when I think about a standard, I think about how we will be judged as upstanders. You know, it's not for me to say whether I'm an upstander or not. It's for my behaviors on a day-to-day -day basis. It's for the people around me, whether it's my wife or my children or those that I work with on a day-to-day basis. -day that they face to understand and to judge whether we're an upstander or not. And if we live our lives that way, if we think about our actions in that way, I think we can and will become the beloved community that we all want and desire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chancellor Juan Salgado. I first want everyone to take a moment to just reflect on what we heard and what are themes that really resonated for you uh, that we share in common. We heard, for example, the importance of family, how family, how a mother shaped a sense of courage, a sense of identity, a sense of confidence, a sense of possibility, and how that is a shared story, the stories of our mothers, yeah? Uh, we heard about uh, the idea of um, community, and how, at the end of the day, it was our interaction or our reaction to community that also shaped 
so much of who we are and what we, what we have a sense of our, our future being. We talked a lot about identity, and the minute it clicks, the minute you know, I'm different from that. And I'm being judged by that difference. What I was starting to say is I can recall the first time that you are called the N-word and where I was and what the circumstances were. I had four brothers, and of course I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm unlike Kim. I didn't have the juice to really do it myself. <laughs> but that sense of being violated in that moment. How dare you call me something? Call me out my name, out of who I am. And the power of that, when it strikes you, I have to do something about this. We talked a lot about um, the consciousness uh, of both belonging to a group and of making choices to create change. And that's a story that's shared here and I'm sure is shared out there. So I just wanted today in a day of stories for us to take a minute to understand what's common in what we heard. Where does our story um, diverge? And in what way did we find the courage to make a conscious choice not to be a bystander, but to be an upstander? Not to be a witness, but to be a warrior. So the last one question that I have for each of you is understanding the data that we've seen this morning, hearing the stories, understanding our mission. What's the one uh, exhortation or um, direction that you would give to all of us to become better warriors and less witnesses? How should we, in this environment that we are in, in this country and in our city, where do you want us to direct our energy, our time, our resources, our intellect, our hearts, our spirits? And so I'm gonna pass the mic, and uh, whoever wants to go first, you know, give us some marching orders. You see they're all jumping at this. <laughs> It is a tough question. I would say get in where you are. I think so often we try to find like what is, who is the group that is doing the thing. Um, and I think what I found for the people who have shaped my life, whether it was my mother who was advocating for educational advocacy for me by moving us, it was, in, it was deeply personal. Um, and that was the space. It's too big. What's happening in the country right now and the rhetoric and the tone and all of that, there will be an inclination to believe that we are not formidable enough to take down one person. But there's your community, there's where you are, there are those numbers that you see that you can actually say something about, whether you can't take on health care and criminal justice and education all at once, there's one of them that matters to you. Um, and waiting for someone to tell you that it's okay for you to speak on this versus feeling that collective responsibility from your personal narrative to do something um, holds so many people back. We wait, that, that is that, that witnessing thing, we wait for the other people to do it and then judge how they do it. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing enough. It's one of the things, uh, having been in elective office, that is like really hard for me to grapple with, that there are so many people who have put so much into me that I say I need you too and that we've abdicated so much of that to others, that we don't own it for ourselves in the personal way um, that we should advocate. My whole journey, my whole being here is deeply, deeply personal. And all of you have that personal whatever it is that you care about. Don't abdicate that experience to someone else and hope that they get it right for you. So that's where I say get in where you fit in, that your voice matters, however small, whether it's a block club, whether it's a, you know, your library council. I'm really big on libraries right now, largely because of what that librarian did to me. <laughs> and it's funny, but not funny. I live in Flossmoor, they had a new policy about how many kids could be at a certain area of the library because there was too many black kids getting loud. And so we ran somebody for the library board. It matters at every single step of the way, and you have to own that. So get in where you fit in, 
um, is my advice. Great. should probably state, I feel like we are already looking into the room of the warriors here. I mean, this is a room full of warriors. I believe that that warrior spirit sometimes, though, can wear on us, particularly because proximity is challenging. But I think it is absolutely critical. It's, it's hard when you're already, and we've learned this in our organizing work with its United Congress, and I think it's why this process is so powerful. This idea of saying, yes, we know you are suffering, in your particular community with your narratives, but your suffering is, in fact, intrinsically connected to the suffering of others. And we need to take that beyond theoretical uh, kind of observation and really internalize and understand the actual reality of that statement. But, you know, a lot of our leaders, for instance, have gone through extraordinary prison sentences. And we meet every Saturday and we sit down and there's like 20, 25, 30 of us and they're talking about the eviscerated programs and state prisons about options that exist. You may think that has nothing to do with you. And there's not a lot of organizing going on to advocate for those who are currently incarcerated, right? We're, we're too busy actually dealing with the tide of brothers and sisters coming home and coming to eviscerated communities with little opportunities. But the fact that there's not educational opportunities that are going on, that they've cut back on so many of the actual scholarships and the programs that exist, that has a direct effect on your reality. And you need to begin to understand that when that brother or sister comes home after a 25 year sentence and is already struggling with the range of criminal disinvestment that has happened both in the neighborhood and that has happened historically in these sets of communities, that their eventual ability to actually just give up on the process will eventually affect your safety, your well being, this kind of anxiety that we have. It will affect our ability to actually think about what it means to live in an integrated, thriving city where neighborhoods are not always hermetically sealed off from one another, where we have to think about one another in these constant, you know, isolated bubbles. So I think proximity challenges us to deal with that. It's not always pretty. It's not always easy. Uh, and certainly there are moments in which, you know, you are, you have to have the radical courage and love and extraordinary faith to be at the table with folks you may have fundamental disagreements with, that you have fundamental, that either because of where, how we were brought up, the narratives that have been festering in our communities have created and sustained these wedges. So I, I think the actual challenge, you know, they used to talk sociologically about the Gold Coast and the slum, right? When you think about Cabrini and next to the, but that reality is increasingly becoming less obvious. So gated community realities are increasingly dis, di, you know, distinct and different from the realities of where a lot of low-income communities are living. And you can live your life uh, in a place like Chicago for 30, 40 years and never have ever encountered uh, a significant conversation with folks who are living on 62nd and Washington or Aberdeen or wherever they may be living. So I think a part of the challenge that we have is to continue to find vehicles and venues to challenge and inspire one another to be in closer proximity, to, to adopt the courage to have, that, to have that inclination. And I think the type of gatherings, uh, what gives me the most hope about a process like the one that we're undertaking with the idea of truth and racial healing and transformation. It is becoming that vehicle. And I, I you know, believe we, without investing in that, we're not gonna get to the place that we need to be. Thank you. Thank you. Real short, real short. Um, I think uh, trust. We have to work on building trust in everything that we do in every moment and every interaction. You know, the, the, the mountain that we still have to climb is that there's still a ways to go. And it's in settings like this where trust has to be extremely strong. And yet we know too, by the way, and I've been involved with this for a little while, that um, in communities, in collaborative efforts, in coming together of lower income communities across our differences in race and ethnicity, we still have not built sufficient trust. And so we need to every day ask ourselves, am I doing what I should be doing to foster trust with my neighbor? And what more can I be doing?
to foster trust at this table, in that table, in this effort, and in that. Thank you. We think about proximity, uh, not just down the block, but you know, across across the city. And then finally, how do we build trust? And certainly, TRHT is all about how we build that sense of trust and communication with each other. Um, I would like you to join me. I, I noticed that I'm falling down on the job here. I was supposed to do State Attorney Kim Fox. So can we have a round of Again, my personal thanks for this opportunity to hear those stories. Well, thank you to everybody that's here. Um, you know, as a 23 year old organizing here, I think a lot of hope uh, because too often I think sometimes, you know, when I think about the others, not necessarily another race or another economic um, position, but sometimes even older folks who I feel disconnected from. So hearing from, you know, badass organizers like Rami, Juan, Rick, Grace. Kim Fox uh, really gives me a lot of hope, so, so thank you all for that. Um, so I have been involved with TRXT for a while now. I'll just give you guys a quick snippet of what it means for me, uh, for what it means for the, for the young people that we organize around. At TRP, we have an initiative called Increase the Peace, where we train young gang-affected people in our communities to be their, the leaders of their community, to organize peace actions and to mobilize against the structural violence that Amanda was talking about. Um, so when I went to California a couple months ago, for me, what TRHT meant was that this could really go a long way in helping young people understand and battle that internalized hatred that they feel towards themselves and towards each other um, that's really caused by all of these factors um, when we face them. If you guys have read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander in it, she talks about this concept that she calls gangster love. Right? And gangster love is basically the idea that when society has an intentional, makes you an intentional target of their social violence, of their disinvestment, then we tend to internalize that hatred and embrace those stigmas that people throw at you, whether it be thug, gangster, criminal, and you internalize them. A large part of my life and or a large portion of the life of the young people that I work with, that's how they feel. And sometimes when they see the other, it's not really even somebody, again, that's a different race, but somebody that's two blocks away from where they live. Um, and for me, TRHC meant the possibility that we can translate this beautiful language that we see about true racial healing and transformation, that our young people can understand that the other person that lives two blocks away from them is just like them, right? And that they are not the problem, but they are the solution to the problems that we face when it comes to structural violence, systemic disinvestment, so on and so forth. So in an attempt to bridge the otherness and to see how we can all relate here to each other, there's a couple of labels all around the room. So we're going to ask you guys to please go to the label that you identify yourself as. So you guys please stand up. I'm about to ask a couple of questions. If you agree with the question and or statement, please come forward to the center. Right? And then I'm asking you to go back, and then I'll ask another question. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, we're going to start with the first question. I just want to point out that we have a self-identified label in the back of the oh, there you go. American, right? There you go. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. All right, so come to the center if you were late today. What the time was late? <laughs> if you were not here at 10 a.m., come to the center. I, I wasn't here at 10 a.m., so I'm, I'm already in the middle. There you go. This is a no judgment zone. All right. All right. Thank you. Go back. All right. Now, 
And actually, for this next question, if you guys want to join us up here in the front, that'd be awesome. Right? And these, set of, these next three set of questions was inspired by uh, the stories that Kim Fox, Rami, and Juan shared. So please stand right here in, in the front of the stage. If somebody at one point in your life has told you, just like they told Kim Fox, you don't belong. Somebody has ever butchered your name, <laughs> or you went, or you went by preferably another name that wasn't your given name. <laughs> okay. Now, stay or come to the circle. If, like Rami, you had a mentor like James that expanded your world view and taught you something that you, you didn't know about your soul or the world around you. Literal. Now, stay in the circle or come into the circle if you're from the south side. Oh, woo -woo. Representing? Woo -woo. I know my family. <laughs> <laughs> You're from and or live in the south side of Chicago. Oh. Or, 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 or
So these are the folks that are in the one here. All right. Now, it's going to be another interesting question. Come into the circle, or stay in the circle, if you have tattoos. for a more just and humane world. So, take a look around you. Right. I don't think anybody's left in any of those categories that we initially put you on. Right. And the reason why we did this activity is because more uh, more or less, these are the categories uh, that are in the census, right? That we're usually categorized in, labeled as, right? Even um, thought of. These are all the categories in which, which society and others and ourselves tend to divide ourselves over, right? But through these questions, we often find that we have a lot of similarities, whether it's the fact that you know, that person that you didn't think had a tattoo actually has a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> or whether that person that you thought was your homie is actually a coast fan. It's still a coast fan. In our real talk, there's a lot more things that unite us and that set us apart. And recognizing that is key to the transformation that we're trying to see. So the task now for lunch, because I know everybody's waiting and ready for lunch time, is to talk to somebody, talk to somebody that you didn't know, right? Or somebody that you don't know well. Build a relationship, because relationships are key to transforming our society, our communities, and our world. So with that task, thank you. Thank you for